ever felt that frustration bubbling up inside of you because there was something that you cared so passionately about but you couldn't do anything to solve it? Have you ever lain awake at night just t playing something over and over and over again in your head because you didn't think you had the solution to solve it? Maybe you cared deeply about the plight of a minority group, but you didn't feel like you had the platform to have your voice heard. Maybe you really wanted to create an incredible product for your customers, but you've been repeatedly told, we don't have the budget for that. Maybe you want to create something amazing. Maybe a book, an oil painted masterpiece, or perhaps even record a song, but you didn't feel you had the talent to do so. I want to tell you about a group of revolutionaries who didn't let a lack of talent, resources, and platform get in the way of pushing forward for what they truly believed and changing the world. Punks. But first, I want to give you a quick history of how punk came to be. On that topic, my first draft of this talk had this long and pretty boring socio-political commentary on what was happening in the US and how that inspired the New York punks to come to be. But the Connect organizers quite rightly uh, pointed me in the direction that maybe I should focus a little bit more on the message I'm trying to get across rather than like the minute history and details of how punk came to be. So with an apology to our US colleagues, we're going to skip over what happened in New York and we're going to head straight into London in 1975. At this point, the UK was in a terrible state. The finance and the money that the government had been pumping into the economy to keep it afloat after World War II was starting to dry up. The government had tightened its belts in all areas of the, of the economy, and the poorest in society were really starting to struggle. The government was at war with the trade unions and the miners, and the miners had started to strike. The UK had to quite literally turn its lights off to survive. It introduced a three-day working week where it, you weren't to, to try and maintain the low coal stocks of the UK. The working class were really suffering. And not just the, the working class, specifically the youth of the working class. There was no future for them. They, in the eyes of the unemployment office, they had no discernible talents. There was no job opportunities. There was just nothing for them. They were dejected, they were desolate, and they were desperate. The metaphorical bonfire had been created. Petrol had been poured all over it. And all that was needed was a spark of revolution. In the UK, that revolution came in the form of Malcolm McLaren. Malcolm McLaren had just had a, had had a small dabblance with the punk scene in the US and had returned to London in May 1975. He joined forces with Vivian Westwood, someone who would go on to become the, probably the most famous punk fashion designer in the world. And they created a small shop, a small boutique shop on London King's Road, simply called Sex. Originally, the shop was a bondage and a fetish wear shop, but it quickly became the center for the hub for London's counterculture. But McLaren wasn't, wasn't, wasn't happy with just being a boutique store owner. He really wanted to cause a revolution in the UK, give the youth something to get behind. So he wanted to start a punk scene in London. But how would he do that? Like all punks, all punks everywhere, he, needed to, he did exactly what every punk would do. He used exactly what he had at hand. There were a couple of regulars in his shop. John Lydon, Steve Jones, Paul Cook, and Glenn Matlock. McLaren suggested that these group of mitzvahs start a band. In return for some early management and some financial support for the band, he said if the, he would provide that if they took the name of the shop as part of the band name. The band chose the name The Sex Pistols, John Lydon changed his name to Johnny Rotten, and the world would never quite be the same again. Now, at the start, the punk scene was really, really small. I mean, there was a couple of hundred fans in London, and even early Sex Pistols gigs, there would only be sort of like 30, 40, 50 people would show up. But that changed on the 1st of December, 1976. Queen, had been booked to, to, to appear on a British TV institution, the Bill Grundy TV show. This is a very, it was kind of akin to the late night talk shows in America. But unfortunately, due to a dental, dental emergency, Freddie Mercury had to withdraw. In a scrabble to find a replacement, EMI proposed a up and coming band that they had just signed, the Sex Pistols. Bill Grundy's producers had no other option, and they had to accept this alternative. 
So, EMI rushed off to find the Sex Pistols, who were rehearsing at the time. They threw them in a limo with a case of wine and rushed them off to the studio. Unfortunately, well, at least for Bill Grundy, the band had polished off all the wine by the time they turned up at the studio. And they rolled into the studio really inebriated. It's also apparent that Bill Grundy had not really been briefed on what was about to happen. And there are some reports that Bill Grundy was also pretty drunk at the time as well. Confronted by this loud, loud mouth rabble of musicians, Bill Grundy really was started to challenge the band. He questioned their lyrics, he questioned the band name, he questioned their general unacceptableness of their being. True to form, the band didn't take this lying down. After a terse conversation, one of the band members swore on live national television. Now, to set some context, this word that was uttered had only been mentioned in the UK twice on national television, and both times it had been debated in Parliament. To set some additional context to the UK at the time, it was still entirely normal to stand and salute when the Queen came on television. Middle England was morally outraged, and this thing exploded all over the newspapers the next day, including one of the large national newspapers running with the, the fam infamous headline, The Filth and the Fury. Overnight, the Sex Pistols went from having hundreds, and, hundreds of thousands of fans to, to being known by the whole of the UK. Punk was no longer underground. Punk was now mainstream. And the UK youth had something to latch on to. They had a platform and a vehicle to express their frustration with what was going on. And punk exploded. At the time, the, the Sex Pistols had just released their God Save the Queen record. That rocketed to number one. And the Sex Pistols went on to sell 1.3 million records. This thing was huge. Now, it's well documented that the early punks had very little uh, discernible musical talent. But how did they get over this? It's pretty simple. They did a couple of things. The first thing they did was they stripped the music back to its simplest form. At the time, bands like Pink Floyd and other prog rockers were going on these really elaborate, self-indulgent 15-minute musical journeys. Punk stripped rock music right back to its core. Two guitars, a bass, and a drummer. They also stripped the song structures back. They made them short, snappy, and really tight. This allowed the punks to turn up the volume, turn up the anger, and turn up the aggression, and have like, a really strong impact with the music that they're producing. OK, so the punks started without any talent. But a lot of the punks actually grew their talent up over time. I mean, if we, don't, if we kind of ignore the Sex Pistols, because if you listen to some later Sex Pistols recordings, it's not entirely clear whether they, they have their instruments up the right way. But a much better example of this is Paul Simonon's hiring to The Clash. Paul auditioned for the band to be the lead singer. But it was eminently clear that he had simply no musical talent, and the band rejected him. Then a couple of weeks later, the band was still looking for a bassist. And they called Paul back. And they hired him purely on the fact that he was pretty handsome and he looked really punk. But over time, Paul went on to become one of the world's most influential bassists. On the first Clash album, he had no talent. He learned all the lyrics, all the bass lines, simply by sitting in his room and learning by repetition. But he is now one of the most respected bassists in the world. His bass lines have been sampled by people like the Beastie Boys, MIA, and even Will Smith. It's really easy to connect this, the, what was happening in the punk scene and, and Paul's specific journey to our leadership principle, start small, learn fast. All of the punks were starting with nothing in terms of skills, and they were learning very quickly as they were doing it. But it is really important that you follow the trajectory of the clash rather than the Sex Pistols. Now, a really good example of this is my team, Merchant Education and Growth. When we started, we were a really, really small team. Two engineers, a product manager, and, um, and a, an engineering manager. The team was focusing on helping merchants make their next step after they've signed up to Klarna. After they've onboarded, Klarna can be a fairly complicated place for them to, to navigate. And we identified a problem. We realized that merchants were taking quite some time to capture their first order, because it was simply too complicated. So we wanted to find a solution for this. 
quickly, we realized that we needed some content support and some design support to make, help us make this happen. Unfortunately, at the time, we didn't have any content support, and the design resources at the uh, domain level were really thinly stretched. So we thought, let's have a crack at it ourselves. We ran a design sprint without any designers. We had engineers writing content, and we had content managers having a stab at design. And because we had no dependencies, we got something out really quickly that we were really proud of. The end result? In the US, we took the average time to first capture from days to hours. Another example of this is, is this talk, right? I, uh, I don't feel like I have the skills or the, or the ability, or the, really the, 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 um, the skills or ability to be standing here in front of you and telling you these things about the punks and how that applies to your leadership principles, right? But I really care about this, and I think it's something that we can learn. So when the Connect organizers contacted me three weeks ago, I was like, sure, it's a really tight timescale, but I think I can do it, and hopefully I'm doing okay. Now, we talked about talent, but there was another issue that the punks had. They had simply had no money, right? So yes, Malcolm McLaren was bankrolling the Sex Pistols, but that money really paled in, in significance to, um, to the money that the big record labels would be pumping into bands at the time. So the punks, we talked about how the punks got over a lack of talent, but they also had, they also had no resources. Sure, Malcolm McLaren was bankrolling the Sex Pistols, but that money must have paled in insignificance to the amount of money that large record labels had at the time. Punks got over this the same way that they got over every other problem. They did it themselves. OK, so small independent record labels existed before punk, but punks took this to a whole new level. The first London punk record label, Stiff Records, was started by, with a far hundred pound loan from the lead singer of the band, Dr. Feelgood. And they're credited with releasing the first UK punk single, a single called New Rose by The Damned. A few months later, the Buzzcocks took this to a whole new level. They produced the first ever British homemade record. They borrowed 500 pounds from their friends and families, and they released the record completely themselves without any kind of input from a record label. If you combine this with the fact that the Sex Pistols had convinced people that you didn't need any talent to have in a, in a band, this sets the, the mindset for like most teenagers' dreams across the world that you can, anyone can be in a band and release a record. I think this is an important parallel to draw to, to your team today. You know, how many times have you been told, yes, we did get a multi-million pound but, uh, funding round just, just to prove, but no, you don't have the budget for that amazing thing that you want to achieve. Right, we have a problem in Klarna that we budget yearly, but we change direction pretty much every hour. I mean, this is probably a status quo that we should potentially challenge. But how do you get around dealing with this situation that when you see an opportunity 10 months down the line after you've, you've uh, asked for a budget, how do you achieve that thing that you, want, you have a few extra resources for? I think what's super key is that you simplify, simplify, simplify at this point. What can you achieve with the resources that you have at hand? We talk a lot in software development about a minimum viable product. For those that don't know, a minimum viable product is, a, is a, the smallest feature set of things that you can get away with and deliver some kind of benefit to your customer. But I hate this term. Minimum viable just sounds like someone saying, what can we get away with, but said by like a politician or a, a business consultant. I really think this would be better if we reframed it as a maximum punk product. Not what's the least you can get away with, but what's the maximum impact you can have with your first ever uh, feature set? It really helps you reframe that, what can we get away with? Imagine, what can we get away with, but said by a group of punks in their rehearsal rooms with a devious, uh, a devious smile and a little hint of destruction in their eyes? Okay, we talked about talent and resources, but there was one final hurdle that the punks had to get over to make their revolution a success. The punks had no platform. In the early days, they, no large record labels would sign them. They solved that problem by doing it themselves. Radio wouldn't play their songs. In fact, in the UK, it was pretty much illegal to play some of the early punk songs because of regulations. They had very little press coverage before the Bill Grundy incident. So what did they do? Same thing they did for everything else. They did it themselves. Fans of punk bands started to create small handmade magazines handwritten and hand-drawn magazines, and sometimes they would use this cut-and-paste methodology of cutting out words to create their headlines. These magazines were called zines. 
They were cheaply photocopied and stapled and then handed out at, at gigs and whenever punk fans uh, met each other. The punks had solved the problem of not having a platform. They'd again done it themselves. I think you can see some of this DNA in the self-publishing that still exists on the internet, right? I think you can see this thread in YouTube and blogs and social media. I think there's definitely some inspiration from punks in how this happens today. And this is something that you can easily do for your team. But there's two things that I think that you should really focus on before you do this. One is a team identity. It may feel like a fun thing to do around Smooth Week to create a logo for your team, some stickers and a t-shirt. But I think people underestimate how powerful this really truly is. Creating identity for your team allows you to, your people to associate the great products and services that you deliver with some kind of identity. The other thing before you start self-publishing as a team is finding your voice. Do your team all know what you're trying to say? Do you understand your why? Before publishing, you need to understand this and work out what that is as a team. Now, self-publishing in Klarna is actually kind of really easy. There's loads and loads of avenues, right? You have email, Slack and even club. When I was writing this talk, I did not think the conclusion that I was going to come to was that publishing your team's newsletter this week is potentially the punkest thing you could ever do. Now, I want to make one thing really, really clear at this point. We've talked about taking inspiration from punks who are potentially aggressive and nasty and snarly, but this is not an excuse to be mean to your fellow colleagues, right? I want you to metaphorically spit in the face of the status quo, not actually spit in the face of your colleagues. You can still be a punk, but still be kind. In fact, Joe Strummer from The Clash famously summarized this as that punk is about exemplary manners to your fellow human beings. And even Johnny Rotten, the lead of the Sex Pistols, classifies himself as a pacifist and cited Mahatma Gandhi as an inspiration throughout his career. Being punk does not give you the authority to be an asshole. Next time you come across a problem where you don't think you have the talent, the resources, or the platform to get over it, I want you to put yourself in the mindset of a punk and ask yourself, what would Johnny Rotten do in this situation? Actually, maybe don't do that, because the answer probably is he'd spit on it and swear it aggressively. But I think this could be some, I think this is summarized much better by Patti Smith, the poet laureate of punk herself. To me, punk rock is the freedom to create. It's the freedom to be successful. It's the freedom to not be successful. It's the freedom to be who you are. It's a freedom. So I want to ask you, if you could unleash your inner punk, what would you do for yourself? Would you release the freedom to create, the freedom to be successful, or the freedom to be who you are? I want you to unlock your inner punk to remove those barriers that are in front of your team and yourself and achieve the thing that you truly believe in. Thank you.